Good evening. Um, sorry I didn't get everything set up because they had a meeting here. <laughs> um, my husband and I moved to Winona about eight and a half years ago, and I am told over and over that we live in the Harris Cotton House. <laughs> Someday it may be our house, but I'm not. It'll <laughs> take a long time. Yeah, I think so. Um, I was introduced to rare books through my husband. He started as a collector, um, sort of a collector, when he was in his teenage years. He also dabbled in antiques and eventually decided books were what he was interested in. He was a literary literature major in college and, and all that. No, he's never written a novel. <laughs> But um, uh, we started the business um, when we moved to Collingswood, or maybe slightly before, and that was about 38 years ago, which is really impossible for me 29. <laughs> <laughs> but what we did was um, we didn't go the route with uh, used and rare books of opening a store. We worked um, out of our house. We. It, um, exhibited book fairs, we did mail order catalogs, and we quoted customers. So our business in those days was my husband sitting in, in a de at a desk typing on a typewriter book descriptions, which later would go to a printer and they'd get bound up and we'd mail them out. And they were just simple typewritten, like two lines describing a book with a price on it, no, no images or anything like that. And people would call up and order them. And at night after I worked my regular job, I would come home at the kitchen table and wrap up the books in, for the orders and get them all packed and UPS would pick them up the next day. Then I'd go home to work and he'd type more catalog descriptions. That's pretty much how we went on. Um, about three years into that, we, we had to move out of the house. Um, we had bookcases running down the middle of our living room, <laughs> our dining room. The kitchen was empty, the bathroom was empty, and we sort of watched TV in this little room on the second floor with two young children. Um, we, we actually started the business at the wrong time because we, we, we had just moved to South Jersey. We had no jobs. <laughs> We didn't know anybody down here, and we had two young children to raise. So it was uh, miraculous that we're, we're still here in business, I think, anyway. So after about three years, um, I threatened to move out unless the books moved out. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we found office space in Haddonfield. And uh, we were there We were there for quite a while, and um, we ended up going through a couple locations. We ended up buying a beautiful Victorian house in Merchantville. We worked out of that for quite a few years. And then we outgrew that three-story house with the full basement. And we ended up buying the school building where we are now in Gloucester City, which is 15,000 square feet. And we also rent two extra large storage lockers because we are out of space. <laughs> anyway. Um, we began in Haddonfield, and at that time, about three years after we actually started the business, uh, I quit my job and began to work for the business full time, and then we actually hired our first employee. Today we have 16 full and part time employees, and I'm hoping to eventually work part time, getting to that point. The question we most frequently hear is what makes a book rare and what is a rare book? The name of our business is Between the Covers Rare Books. So what is a rare book? Well, one of the misconceptions of rare books is that rarity is the final determinant of value. It is not. Yet in theory, rarity enhances the value. Objectively, a book may be very rare. I in the late, early 1800s, your great, 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 great Uncle Bob wrote his memoirs. He had 20 copies printed and bound up, and he gave them to friends and neighbors. 
In the whole world, there are 20 copies of this book. It's rare. Not only that, it's old. It's from the early 1800s. But great uncle Bob, well, we'll get, we'll get to know him a little bit more later. You decided to move Marie Kondo your house. So I bought Uncle Bob's book a month ago at a yard sale for a dollar. Okay? I just bought myself a rare book. Books. <laughs> Three copies were there. Okay. A better approach to understanding the value of what, what are called rare books is to consider the demand for them. Very simply, supply and demand, like anything else in commerce, really does determine the price. The rarity, the scarcity, does not. A first edition of The Great Gatsby, an iconic American novel, was published in a run of about 20,500 copies. I'm sure thousands of them still exist. But even though there are thousands of them, a reasonably nice copy of the book. I'm sorry, I think it's out of everything. I don't have a copy of the book to show you because as soon as we get one in inventory, it sells. That's how popular this book still is. Okay, so that's what it looks like. It's just a green or bad book. And today, when you come across a copy, you can buy one, depending on the condition, for three to five thousand dollars. But if you find a copy like this with its original dust jacket, you're talking a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. The reason for this The reason for this is because it's an iconic book. It's not particularly rare. It's scarce, there aren't a whole lot of copies, but it's iconic. It checks off a lot of boxes. Um, a lot of people have read The Great Gatsby. It is one of the most collected books by people who collect American literature. Everybody wants a copy, so they get huge demand. And for some reason, the dust jackets didn't survive. Books from the early 1900s, they all had dust jackets, even the late 1800s. I think dust jackets came into being in the mid-1850, 1860. They started making dust jackets for books. People took them off and threw them away. So people who collect books want the books in original condition, and that means it has to have the dust jacket. When you talk about early books, early books meaning hundreds and hundreds of years old, they talk about is it complete, does it have all the sections it's supposed to have. For modern books, you have a dust jacket and you have a book. If you have the dust jacket and the book, it's complete. It's much easier than early books. I'm sorry if you're confused, but we'll get to more about that later. Um, When I picked up Uncle Bob's book for a dollar, I priced it at $10. Okay, what makes the book collectible then? The edition, the condition of the book, the historical importance. Say <coughs> Uncle Bob was a famous doctor who, in his day, was known to have cured a disease which we no longer have anymore. It's gone. Uncle Bob cured <coughs> Uncle Bob is now an important, iconic figure in medicine. So this book just got a little more value. Maybe not $10. Um, the beauty of the book, what the book looks like. Some people collect books not just on the words inside, but the actual physical object, because it can look bad. This is a book published and printed in the early 1800s in a cloth binding. It, it looked a lot better, you know, 100 or 200 years ago, uh, whatever year we're in. But this is what 
plain brown lighting. You're not having people clamoring for these unless there's good content. Um, if Uncle Bob was flush and wanted to make a nice book for his friends and relatives, he would have had it bound really nicely. Green Morocco, gold gilt, raised bands, kind of raised bands, um, inlays for the for the leather binding. And if it was a good binder, it would be what's called a signed binding, because in the lower rear, they usually they didn't particularly sign it. They have their label or their name, so you know who the binder is. People collect particular bindings. The most famous I can think of are Rollier bindings. He was an Italian binder who designed books, and there's a book collectors club in New York called the Rollier Club. So Uncle Bob's book, if he sprang for this, it's going to be worth more money because. It now has an audience that's wider than just a book from the early 1800s, <coughs> a medical doctor who did well. It's now pretty. Top edge gilt. They, they gilt it. Actually, this is all edges gilt. They would gilt the books. And pretty much um, the practice started to protect the paper, protect the edges, edges of the paper from damage. So, Rarity does count, but it, 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 it doesn't always. It just depends on the book. Um, let's go back to Uncle Bob again. Say he had, he had 20 copies of this book printed. One was destroyed in a fire. One was attacked by a three-year-old. One was flooded in someone's basement etc. Maybe you're down to 15 extent copies now. So it's become scarce. Is it more valuable? What if he wasn't a doctor? Probably not. So another thing that makes a book collectible is um, an association. If the book, this is after it's published, if the book belonged to a particular person and the author Okay, I'm sorry. An association goes, um, covers many areas. Very quickly, if I wrote a book and I inscribed it to another famous author, it would be an association between the two of us. If someone famous wrote a book and they inscribed it to their mentor, someone that, you know, was in the same field as them, say one doctor to another, they're both known doctors. There's an association between the people who own the book or have written the book, and it's in the book, there's proof of it. So that is um, increasing its value, even if the book itself without the association wouldn't be quite as valuable. Um, say Uncle Bob, inscribed a copy to Lily May, his children's babysitter. Later, she became a, an important subject. That book is now an association copy, because Uncle Bob was famous, Lily May became famous as a suffragette, and it's inscribed to her. They knew each other, so that would help the, the value of that book. Um, does anyone, I, have you heard of the Gutenberg Bible? Can anyone tell me why it's so iconic? Why it's so valuable? It's not the author. Right? It's not the title. The press machine? There are 50 million Bibles. I'm sorry? Printing press? Yes. It's famous because of Mr. Gutenberg, the printer. He, he came up with a printing press in 14, mid 1400s that had movable type. You could print a book, you could, you could set the type, you, like, like a typewriter has A, B, C, D, they're metal pieces of type that the ink would go on. And these were created and the book was pressed and Gutenberg may not even be able to read, we don't know. 
but you you couldn't do it in a, a mass production. You couldn't do it quickly. You couldn't do a lot of them. He came up with individual letters, setting individual letters in a tray of type to be printed, and then you could take the tray out, change all the letters, and, and print something else. It's, I'm not a printer, but it revolutionized printing in, at that time. Uh, evidently, the Chinese did it a little bit earlier than the Europeans, but um, the Gutenberg Bible is so valuable, so rare, because everyone wants it, because it's an example of the first book in Europe printed with movable type. I happened to see a copy of this, and it was in Germany, it was in a darkened room, I mean dark, everything was black, and it was in a case like here, it's kind of, a, kind of a big book, and it's all temperature controlled, and it's just open to a page. There's nothing, you look at it, it's like, eh, an old book. It doesn't look like anything, but it's what it is. So that's an example of value added to a book. Um, there is no one way to say what is rare, what is valuable. It all depends on a lot of different factors. Um, after we started business, um, the tech world came, and uh, our lives changed. Booksellers' lives changed. We had the internet. We had our own printers. We, we could. Um, you know, we got computers, we got custom databases, and we could sell books online all of a sudden. It, uh, it's, it's sort of, um, it's almost like today, it's like pre-COVID and post-COVID, but it was like pre, the business was pre-internet and after internet. And um, it's, it's really changed the face of book selling. Uh, which you probably realize, because if you ever wanted a book that was out of print years ago, you had to find some that had a search service, something you know, along that line today, you just go to a million websites, just Google it, look for it, you can find it, almost anything that's at home. Um, it helped our business in that my husband is, a, he buys books, but he buys everything. He buys lots of things, which is why we now have <laughs> 15,000 square foot building and two storage lockers. But before the internet, if the books that he bought and didn't get into a catalog, this is one of our catalogs today, it just sat around in boxes, on shelves, in, in, you know, in the basement. Um, the internet has allowed us to put all these books in a database and you can search for them. Uh, if you're under the age of 30, you probably think I would be crazy even considering typing a catalog in. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. So I just wanted to let you know that the internet has really helped booksellers and, and customers who are looking for books. If you notice, there are less bookshops open these days. Um, when this happened, a lot of people, small businesses that had shops, they closed them up, said, I'm going to put my books online, mail them from home, and that's it. So that did create a scarcity of bookshops. The second most common question we get is, where do you get your books? Well, buying books and what we buy is this pretty much the same thing as buying antiques and any other collectibles. Um, there's kind of like a food chain. Um, you know, if it's Chicken Boy, Chippendale High Boy, a book, an antique car. It's, it, you're going to have a, a number of people owning it and selling it, and you could purchase it anywhere in between from like the yard sale to uh, classified ad. And eventually, someone who knows more about that object is going to buy it from the first person, and so on and so on, until someone finally finds a good retail customer. Um, we consider sort of ourselves at the top level for books in our field that are collectible, literature.
literature, African American literature and history, women's history. Um, but those are some kind of um, subjects that we really focus on. Um, Tom started as a book scout. What that means is he would comb flea markets, yard sales, bookshops, find books to buy that he was learning were valuable through trial and error. And he would then go and sell them or trade them for better books to, to establish book dealers. That is how he learned the business. I mean, it, it was as simple as that. Um, you, you learn real fast, like, don't buy a box of National Geographics because you're going to die with them. <laughs> but um, that is the primary way to learn, is to just get out there and, and with the antiques, they're called runners. With books, we're called book scouts. Um, so we get a, books from a variety of sources. We get books from private collectors, uh, people who collected books, say like me, in, in the area of wine, and it's like, I'm done, okay? I've got them all, I've read what I want to read, I'm moving on. Hi, would you want to buy my wine book collection? So we get people, mostly who we've known through the years, who want to get rid of their collections. So that's one way we get books. Uh, we get books from estate sales. Um, one, an early estate sale my husband went to was right here in Winona, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous house that is now occupied by David and Gustavo. <clears throat> that house had, maybe someone here remembers when they had an, an auction, uh, I think the owner had passed away, and uh, Tom went there and said, that's a beautiful town, Winona, and you know, it took 30 years before we found you again. <laughs> so, um, um, and we do, not every bookseller does it this way, but we will buy the inventory of shops going out of business, closing, that just don't want to have their inventory anymore. We, we've done that. Um, one of the most notable buys was, um, you know, heard of Larry McMurtry. He's a novelist and a screenwriter. He was also a bookseller. And he, in Texas, he had, um, he must have owned like a half dozen Huge buildings in town, huge, huge. Anyway, he was getting older and he decided to not burden his son with the books, who's a singer songwriter, which is really good. And he wanted to sell the books. This was before he passed away. So he had an auction. Every major dealer from around the country flew to Texas, in the middle of nowhere, and he auctioned off his his books, section by section by section. We ended up buying so many books, we had to, we had to get a tractor trailer. I mean, literally <laughs> a tractor trailer, and we filled it, um, have them driven back to our warehouse in Foster City. So, um, yeah, that's how we get books. And we do buy books at book fairs, too. Uh, book fairs are where a bunch of booksellers go, they set up booths, nice nice book fairs have glass cases, and then there's a lot of buying and selling before the show opens, probably just like antique shows. There are good book fairs, there are bad book fairs. Bad in that you can't buy anything, and you can't sell anything, that's, you know. My husband's at a fair this weekend, I'll see be here to help me. But uh, he's, he's out at a, at a show, and he's there uh, buying. He, we had to set up a booth, you know, set up a table with items, but for him, that's a, it was just a buying show. He's getting new inventory from other dealers who are exhibiting there. Some book fairs are, are more famous, more well-known, and that's where we sell books. The two best in the world are in London and Manhattan.
What do you buy? Well, lots of things. Individually, we don't buy a lot of books. Dealers who specialize in one particular area, say, say if you like New Jersey books, there's a dealer in Princeton, Princeton area, Joe Falcone. If you, if you want to, if he wants to buy a book, he's going to buy a book on New Jersey for his inventory. We may not buy a book on New Jersey. We may, we may not. We don't have a huge customer base for it. So what do we buy? Really, almost anything we particularly like. And I'm going to contradict myself, because there's an exception to everything I'm saying, and it always all depends. Um, we know what our customers are looking for. A lot of our customers these days are institutions, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, University of Texas, and you know uh, some European institutions. We know what area their special collections want to buy in. So we um, we buy knowing that we can sell it to them. A lot of things we we buy. We, do, we can quote to customers, they never make it into a catalog. And um, then the areas that we are strong in, that we, we want to be known for, literature, African American literature and history, we will, we will really try and fill in spots, like for a while, Faulkner. Faulkner was getting low, it's like, instead of having three shelves of Faulkner, we were down to a half a shelf. It's like, Faulkner keeps selling, my goodness, we've got to get more good Faulkner. <laughs> because everyone still buys Faulkner. Same as Swiss Reverend, Swiss Reverend. So that's what we buy. Uh, most likely, the books that we buy, aside from those in, in coming from a store, will be in excellent condition. Um, they will be complete. Which they will have their dust jacket. They're supposed to have a dust jacket. A lot of early books, they fall apart. Things happen to them. They're missing pages, sections. We're not interested in a book that's not complete, unless it's the Gutenberg product. So there are incomplete <laughs> copies of that for sale. Um, generally, we want first editions. Um, we want books that are scarce. Um, and we want books that are in demand. I love John Galsworthy's writing. Nobody else does it anymore. He's an English novelist from the early 1900s. I just love his writing. I can't sell a Gals, Gals, I can't give away a Galsworthy book. So we're not going to buy more Galsworthy, no matter how much I like him, because no one's interested in Galsworthy right now. They have to remake some of his books into movies. That, that, <laughs> um, now, I picked up Uncle Bob's book because I'm not a yard, so I said, that's unusual. I've never seen this before. I flipped open to the title page, and I. So this is probably self-published. I'm just, you know, it's a dollar. So I picked it up. So if it's unusual, I'd be interested. That brings me to first editions. People ask us, well, how do I know if my book is a first edition? Well, it ain't easy. This is a book. It's one of our, uh, we, have, we have a small room full of just reference books. This is a book on, what is it called? Collected Books, The Guide to Values, 1998 edition. You don't look at this book for values anymore. What's great about this is in the appendix, they have, which everyone who works for us has a copy of these photocopied pages at their desk, first edition identification by publisher. This lists all the major and minor American and English publishers, mostly all books written in the English language. Say you have a book by Knopf. You look up Knopf, see what their coding was, what dates, and match it to the book you have in hand. And hopefully you can figure it out. Scribner's, early on, they, they noted theirs with the, the letter A. Then they stopped using the letter A. You have to know when did they stop? When do I need to have the letter A to, to recognize it as a first edition? So there's, there's reference that, you know, people ask us all the time, well, how do I know if it's first? You can't, it's not that easy. A lot of modern books today, I'm saying modern in, say, the last 20 years, you'll see on the copyright page, you'll say first edition, and then you'll see a number line. Usually you go 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 
one to 90, dot, dot, dot. 500, you know, John Grisham, there's going to be a lot in that first printing. Um, that's, a, that's a quick and easy way to tell from modern books if it's a first edition. But then you have to remember, during sometime in the 80s, Random House decided they're going to start the number line with the number two. So you had to know what years Random House started all their books with the number two instead of number one like everyone else to know if it's a reprint or not. So that's how we tell if a book is a first edition. After we have the books and we bought the books, how do we assign a value to the books? How do we know to price them? We don't always get this right, which is why we have so many books. <laughs> half of it's pure science, and half of it's art. It's like my antique dealer people here. It's like anything else in the secondary market. You have to know the history of the item and what it is sold for, what the auction records, records are for it, if it's you know, particularly high in piece, it'll have auction records. And then there's an art to it, you experience. How many copies of, okay, how many copies of the Rose Directory to Seaside, New Jersey, have I handled? It's totally not something I'm going to find a lot in auction records, but it's a New Jersey book. We bought and sold this over and over and over again, and we know what people are going to pay for it. So that's part of the science. Um, and you can look online, see what people are asking for. You know about listing sites? Um, Amazon, Libris, Biblio, the EAA. Uh, we have our own, most of us have their own websites. Um, you go to these search services, uh, they don't sell books, they're just, they're just computer companies. And multitude, thousands of booksellers upload their inventory to these services. And when you go to the websites, you look up, oh, I got this book. You look it up, see what you can find, but you have to remember find a comparable copy. Does it have a dust jacket? It doesn't. Anyway, you have, to, you have to pay attention to the details. So the art part of this is um, see, say I have a, a book signed by uh, Toni Morrison. It's the first signed copy of Toni Morrison I've ever seen. So I'm going to, and I can't find another copy online for sale, because her books sell very quickly too. I'm going to look to see what, I know she's written other books, I'm going to see what other book, say, um, uh, um, Song of Solomon, is, can I find a copy of that sign and get an idea then? So if that book's $500, maybe Lewis Eye is worth more because it's a more iconic book. So that's part of the art. You can, you can play around and start digging into things and looking up information on the authors and the titles and things like that. Um, uh, going back to Uncle Bob, who's now an iconic figure, who had put his book in a really nice binding, I still don't know what to price this book because there are no comparables. Um, what am I going to do? What am, what am I going to do? I'm going to read the Dorn memoir to see if I can pick out also anything else. Is there good local history in that? Can, it, uh, can what he wrote apply to a bigger audience than, than his ancestors, uh, descendants? Um, so I will play around with local history, and, and if he is that famous doctor, I will see what other things, uh, books in, in that field sell for. You just pull in a bunch of information, and then you make up a price, and hope it sells. <laughs> That's just the art part, but the science, the science is pretty important. Uh, Jeannie asked me if we ever found exciting things in older houses. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read to you two things that my husband wanted, thought were the most interesting for what it's worth. First of all, before we go on a house call, we ask the people, what do you have? What are you selling? How many books do you have? These days you said, you know, take pictures of the spine, send us images. And people do, and they tell us, and we'll get to the house. We're interested. And what they want to sell, what they think is great, is like, eh. But over in that corner, we're like, that's good. And you just don't know where you're going to find. House calls are great. Um, so once we went on a house call, and Tom actually went to this house to look at antiques. And when he got there, he saw somehow they showed him they had they had a two large boxes of Ernest Hemingway's private papers. They had trash picked them up off the curb in Key West years before. <laughs> so they had these boxes, they didn't know what to do with it. It included an unpublished poem written on the back of a manila envelope from a Paris lingerie shop, his annotated copies of bullfight programs from Spain, his checkbook, and of course, many of his canceled checks, which all have a signature on it. And that was, that was a good find. <laughs> uh, another time he went, this is in South Jersey, it's just a little ranch house. Um, nothing special, the people were retiring moving to Florida. They called us to look at some literary letters, letters from authors. So letters from authors, you know, of course, we're, we're going to buy them. We're interested in that. But when he got there, they showed him a few other things. He discovered there were four very rare maps with routes to the California gold, gold fields printed in 1849. At the time, the last set of these maps sold for, at auction, for $40,000. So that was a good find. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to, if anyone here wants to know what should I collect, that's easy. Anything you're interested in. Because anything that you're interested in, there have been books written about it. They're out there. Cat books. I like cats. Yeah, I started buying cat books. Um, anything, and it doesn't have to be, well, it can be more than just, I like this author, I like, like books on horses. It could be people collect bindings, people collect miniature books. In fact, one customer comes to book fairs with her ruler because they have to be a certain size. She's not interested. Uh, people collect books if they're fine press, they're nicely printed, um, if they're particular illustrators, on and on and on. So if you want to collect books, you'll find something to collect. Beware. Um, I do know one, one bookseller in, um, he was in Beverly Hills. He since sold his building, but um, he had an amazing clientele in Beverly Hills. And he was selling books so much to one person, this bookseller, paid for an addition on his house to put the books in. <laughs> so, they can get out of here. Um, um, you can also, you can always find dealers that uh, specialize in your particular book. I mean, then you're going to get a wealth of information from them because dealers love to talk about their books. And they will tell you anything and everything you want to know about those miniature books that are on this bit. Um, collecting books may seem quaint, obscure, esoteric. The word antiquarian books is really a misnomer. It's sort of a, um, it, it, it's sort of just a catch-all term. But antiquarian books does not mean old books. Um, as you can look at our general literary catalogs, these are all pretty much new books in dust jackets. And uh, so I wouldn't call them antiquarian books. It's just, a, it's just a general term, so don't let it scare you. Um, now, if you collect, if you don't 
know if you're a collector. I'll, I'll just tell you this. If you, if you buy a book on a subject, you have one. It's a curiosity. If you buy a second book on the subject, you're now a collector. <laughs> now, getting back to Gutenberg, I just want to I just want to mention Bibles because we frequently get people calling us say, "I have, you know, my my old family Bible that I want to sell. I don't know why they want to sell it, but they do." And um, Bibles in general are not valuable. There are so many. Of most Christians in the world have a Bible. And a lot of them have family genealogy in them, and uh, they're lavishly illustrated, they have beautiful bindings. Can't sell them. So you're not going to get much money for your Bible. With the exceptions of many things, which I will tell you a couple things about Bibles. Um, the Gutenberg Bible we, we, we talked about. A few years ago at auction, the Bay Psalm book, printed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, this is just a book of Psalms, sold. Um, it was printed in 1640, and it sold for millions of dollars because it was the first book published in North America. That's what made it iconic, not that it was a Bible, it was because it was the first book published in this now our country. Um, another famous Bible is the Eliot's Indian Bible, printed in the Algonquin language in 1663. That, that will buy you, according to my husband, if you have that, you can buy yourself a really high-end luxury car for, for that Bible, if you happen to find it. Check the language. Um, going to work is always fun for us. We just love what we do. Tom loves the discovery. I love to sit there and see what's selling, what's moving out the door. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's great. And in closing, I want to quote the English novelist Anthony Powell. Books do furnish a room. And you know that. <laughs> Thank you.